Now time for question period. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Well, thank you uh, very much, Speaker. And my question this morning is to the Premier. Premier, on November 18th in this House, Minister of Agriculture, you affirmed order. that your government had established a process to consult with parents on proposed changes to the Liberal sex education curriculum. But, Premier, over the past three months, I have heard from thousands of parents from across Ontario who have told me that no such consultation took place and, Premier, that order. the period for consultation is now over. Premier, why did you suggest to this House that you expected the chairs of each school council to consult with parents on the sex ed curriculum when this was, by the order of your Minister of Education, never going to happen? Thank you. Well, <laughs> Mr. Please Speaker, in the race. Mr. Race Speaker um, let me just be clear. We were, we were, and the Minister of Education was very clear that all of the schools in the province, all 5,000 schools, the school council chairs, were being asked to take part in a consultation. That means that every region of the province, Mr. Speaker, every school, every school council chair had access to the consultation process, Mr. Speaker. And that is exactly what happened. And we have, uh, we have completed that process, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that the health and physical education curriculum is out of date. In fact, it's dangerously out of date, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Children in our society need the information that is contained in an up-to-date health and physical education curriculum, Mr. Speaker. The fact is they are going to get information somewhere, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We want to make sure they get the right information and that they get information that is based on evidence, Mr. Speaker. You see that, please? You see that, please? Order. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, back to the Premier. Premier, you clearly stated, and I quote, that the role of a school council chair is to talk to the people in his or her school and to get that input and then feed that input into a process. Yet, Premier, the survey itself says, and I quote, to support the quality and integrity of the data collected from parent representatives, we strongly encourage parent representatives to complete the survey independently. That is, Premier, without consulting parents. Premier, when you stood here and said you expected school council chairs to conduct consultations, cons consultations the Liberal Party promised back in 2010, were you aware that your Minister of Education was working against a proper consultative process? Question. Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that I think five thousand parents who are informed parents who are connected to their school communities and I don't know if the member opposite has ever been a school council chair I have mr. speaker and I know that when you're a school council chair you're in touch with your community you hear from your community you know what your community is about and you have conversations with your community so 5,000 parents from around this province from every region every of this province mr. speaker every school had access to this process but I I guess the, for me, the real issue is that this health and physical education curriculum that is in place in Ontario right now dates back to 1998, Mr. Speaker. We need to have, we need to have this curriculum updated. We engaged in a consultation. We're behind, we're behind jurisdictions like British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, Mr. Speaker. And the update has to. Thank you. Uh, the member from Chatham Kent Essex will come to order. Final supplementary. Well, back to the Premier. Speaker, <clears throat> Premier, I can only conclude that when you stood up in this House and defended this so called process, that you simply had no idea what the actual process was Minister that your Minister of Education had established. Perhaps, Premier, much in the same way that Dalton McGuinty had no idea about the new sex ed agenda his Ministry of Education and her officials had planned back in 2010. Enough of the secrecy, Premier. Enough of defending a process that doesn't even exist. When are you going to start respecting the role of all parents in the education of their children? Premier, when do you plan on releasing the proposed new curriculum to all Ontario parents so that the real consultation process can begin? 
Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. While the, the curriculum will be posted on the Ministry of Education website for all to see, yeah. uh, within weeks later this winter it will be posted, Mr. Speaker, and it will be rolled out in classrooms in yeah, September 2015, right Mr. Speaker. The fact is that the curriculum that we have in place in Ontario is out of date. We need to have it updated, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure what the real agenda of the member opposite oh, is. I'm I not sure know. if the fear-mongering has more to do with his leadership campaign, Mr. Speaker, or whether it has to do with a very small group of people, Mr. Speaker, who want to stir up fear about the reality that kids need information. They need to understand how human beings relate to each other, Mr. Speaker, and they need to get that information based Answer. on science. That's what the curriculum will do, Mr. Yep. Speaker, and it will be available very shortly on the website. New question. Well, Speaker, my Nathan second Middlesex. set of questions is also for the Premier regarding an ongoing criminal investigation in the conduct of her officials. Oh. Premier, the Sudbury by-election was quickly called for midwinter. You ignored what your own local party members had to say and appointed your candidate. Premier, as you know, the OPP have noted their belief that the Liberals broke the law by attempting to lure a potential candidate with a government or political job. Premier, something stinks here. Ontario residents deserve to know what inducements were offered to keep Mr. Olivier out of the Sudbury by-election race. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I have said repeatedly in this House and uh, elsewhere, any suggestion that anything was offered in exchange for any action is simply false, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that I had made a decision. I had made a decision to appoint a candidate, to appoint Glenn Tebow as our candidate in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, and he is going to be and is a wonderful MPP. Having made that decision, Mr. Speaker, there were conversations with the former candidate, uh, the past candidate, to try to keep him involved in the uh, in the party, Mr. Speaker. That was that was the initiative because I believe, as I have said, I believe that it is important to keep people involved when they have taken part in an election, when they have been part of a party process. So we reached out to him to try to keep him involved. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that the decision Answer. was made to appoint a candidate and. The initiative was to keep him involved in the party. Thank you. Premier, you can continue to dance around this issue or you can use the time to come clean with the people of Ontario. There can be no doubt that your Deputy Chief of Staff went to Sudbury with the intent of influencing Mr. Olivier and inducing him not to join the race. In fact, the OPP have investigated and they're of the belief that the law was broken when a government or a political job was offered. Deputy House Premier, Speaker, come to order. What exactly did you or your staff or the Ontario Liberal Party offer to Mr. Olivier to step aside? Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Well, well, thank you, Speaker. And you know, I think this is an interesting issue, and I think it is acknowledged, Speaker, that all parties uh, do work to keep former uh, candidates. In Order. If I was absolutely sure of what somebody said, I would ask them to withdraw. But I'm not 100% sure, and I think he gets my message. Thank you. I think Ontarians actually expect more of their elected leaders, Speaker, than the politics of personal destruction, Speaker. Both the, uh, the, both from the Leeds, Grenville, parties have appointed, appointed candidates in elections. Both the Tories and the NDP have sought to keep past candidates involved. And I guess I have a question back. If you think back to January 2009, think of that January 2009, the member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lake, Answer. Um, actually, and it might just be a coincidence, Speaker, it might be a coincidence, but on the very same day as she Thank resigned you. her seat. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. Premier, OPP investigator Detective Aaron Thomas says, and I quote, I believe the words spoken by both Lougheed and Cerbera to Olivier assist me in my belief the criminal code offence has been committed." Unquote. Premier, in fact, your government 
and your party is under three different OPP police investigations. Premier, are you saying that you had personally no conversations with Ms. Cerbera or Mr. Lougheed about Andrew Olivier and the Sudbury by-election? Speaker, as I was saying, um, on the very same day in January 2009, the member for Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock resigned her seat so the new leader could win and was given a paid job the very same day. The Sudbury Star says Scott trades job seat for head office job. The Sudbury Star, January 10, 2009, Progressive Conservative Lori Scott was given the job Friday of getting the opposition party ready for the next election in exchange for giving up her seat in the Ontario Legislature. The Peterborough Examiner says, in exchange for giving up her seat, Scott is taking on the enormous responsibility of election readiness chairwoman for the party. Speaker, the record speaks for itself. New question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. To the Premier. Premier, when we asked you yesterday about. That was uh, the wrong rotation. Oh, come on. It was so good, though. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question's for the Premier. The Premier promised that she was going to clean up corruption and cover-ups after 10 years of Liberal scandal when she came into office. She claimed that she was going to lead the most open and the most transparent government in Canada. But the report from the Glass Gas Plants Committee speaker shows that not a lot has changed. The gas plant scandal started with a cover-up, and the report is an attempt to cover up the cover-up. But let's be honest, covering up isn't uh, the same thing as cleaning up, Speaker. So my question to the Premier is, will she stop trying to cover up her scandals and start cleaning up? I was uh, qu quite uh, lenient up to that point. The member is accusing another member. Please withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, you know, I'm I'm very glad that the Justice Committee has uh, completed its report, and and Mr. Speaker, the report's clear on a number of points. The report is clear that the large-scale siting uh, energy siting process. The uh, member from Leeds Grenville will come to order a second time. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke come to order a second time. And if you continue, it'll be a third time. And last, and the deputy's not helping. Carry on. There were a number of findings, Mr. Speaker, that I think uh, make it clear that the work of the committee uh, really did um, unveil some of the challenges that, that yeah, were, we right. were confronting. The large-scale energy siting process failed, the costs were unacceptably high, record-keeping was inadequate, and new rules were needed for the minister. Stop the clock. <laughs> the member will withdraw. Withdraw, uh, Speaker. Carry on rules were needed for the minister's office staff. So the fact is Answer. that there are 16 recommendations that uh, are designed to improve the siting process, improve record retention. Those recommendations are very important, and I'm glad that we've got them as a result of the Thank committee's you. work. Supplementary. There is something seriously wrong when the Premier's office is trying to distract people from a criminal investigation into a bribery scandal in Sudbury with a billion-dollar gas plant scandal and its criminal investigation. Politicians owe it to the people of this province to do much better, Speaker. Using one scandal with a criminal investigation to distract from another scandal and criminal investigation is pretty darn cynical, Speaker. When will this Premier take the responsibility seriously, clean up her government, clean up her office and clean up her party so we can start getting into the issues that really matter to the people of this province. Well, you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, the fact is, two and a half years of work this committee did. There were over 400,000 pages of documentation that were looked at, Mr. Speaker. There were 93 witnesses that came forward. As 
the process rolled out, Mr. Speaker. We worked to change some of the rules that we knew needed to be changed, to change the citing process, to change the rules around document retention. And now, Mr. Speaker, we have the recommendations of the committee, and there are there's further recommendation there that we can follow. The fact is, there were 16 recommendations that came out of the committee's work. The NDP, to their credit, actually put some recommendations in their minority oh. report. Strangely, the opposition, the uh, con Conservatives, had no recommendations except to continue to meet. So the fact is, we have those recommendations. We will follow them, Mr. Speaker, and Answer. we appreciate the work that all the committee members did. The fact is named Peter Feist, Speaker. That's what the fact is that these Liberals will not let come into this House. This Premier, though, Speaker, insists, and in fact, she kept insisting, that she was going to be so different and she was going to clean things up around here. Yesterday, she stood up in this House to protect her Deputy Chief of Staff, whose actions are part of a criminal investigation by the OPP in the Sudbury by election. The gas plant report shows that the Premier protected Dalton McGuinty's Deputy Chief of Staff, whose actions are part of a breach of trust investigation by the OPP Speaker. The Premier said she was going to be different. So why is the Premier doing the same things all over again, Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, when I came into this office, I said clearly that we would open up the process around the committee. We did that, Mr. Speaker. That's why the committee met for two and a half years. That's why there were 93 witnesses and 400,000 documents, Mr. Speaker, that were read. I said, Mr. Speaker, that we would get back to get to report writing once the election was over mr speaker the ndp decided on the timing of the election they decided when the election was going to be mr speaker we went through the election we were clear that we were going to have report writing that report writing has happened we have order, order. finished New question. Leader of the third party. The question is also for the Premier. The Liberal gas plant report claims that the blowing of $1.1 billion came down to, quote, inadequacies of record keeping and document uh, retention policies and training, unquote. Now, as my friend Peter Cormos would have said, bull spit. Liberals deleted emails and they got caught. End of. Yesterday, the Premier said, quote, there was no specific offer made to Mr. Olivier. I call bullspit again on that, Speaker. The Liberals told Olivier, quote, name your price, and they got caught. The Premier tried to cover up the gas plant cover-up, Speaker. Will she come clean with the Sudbury by-election scandal, or will we just see more cover-ups? Stop the clock, please. Um, I'm trying my best to ensure that I'm listening very carefully to all questions and all answers. I'm going to ask temperance when it comes to language and uh, to try to uh, bring it to a decorum here that allows us to go without having to be called to order. Uh, I'm not doing that right now, but all I'm asking for is a little temperance when we deliver our questions and answers. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, on the second part of the leader's question in terms of the, uh, the Sudbury by-election, I've been very clear. I've answered that question a number of times in terms of having made a decision to appoint a candidate and, to, uh, and then working to keep a past candidate involved. Let me go to the first part of the question, which was about the, uh, the report of the Justice Committee. So, Regarding the cost of the relocations, the opening of the report says, and I quote, it is clear that the cost was unacceptably high. I agree with that. Regarding local input, the report says it's clear that communities have not been sufficiently engaged in the large-scale energy siting process. I agree with that, Mr. Speaker. The report and the uh, Information Privacy Commissioner said that not enough was done to ensure that the ministers and premier's office staff were aware of their record retention responsibilities. I agree, Mr. Speaker. The fact is, those recommendations that flow out of those and those uh, insights, Mr. Speaker, are very Order, important. Please. We have taken action yes, on many of them. Mr. Speaker, and we will take all of them very seriously. Thank you. 
There is an old saying that you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Ontarians deserve the facts. Minister of Economic Development, come to order a second time. Who made the decision to offer a job, any job, to Andrew, Andrew Olivier so that he would stop seeking the Liberal nomination in Sudbury? Who did Thank that? You. Speaker? Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the characterization that was just expressed of what happened in Sudbury is simply not the case. That is not what happened, Mr. Speaker. Here's what happened. I made a decision as the leader of the Liberal Party. It is my prerogative, and I made a decision to appoint a candidate in Sudbury, and that candidate was Glenn Tebow, Mr. Speaker. Having made that decision, Decision, Mr. Speaker, there were attempts to keep a young man who had run for us in the previous election to keep that young man involved, Mr. Speaker. There were no specific commitments. Order. There were no specific offers. There were offers and suggestions about what he Answer. might consider in order to stay involved, Mr. Speaker. And I would expect any leader in this House to work to keep so. someone involved who had run for them in a previous election, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. The Premier keeps insisting that there was no offer made to Andrew Olivier. There was, Speaker. Pat Cerbera offered him, quote, a full-time or part-time job at a constituency office or, quote, appointments to boards or commissions, end quote. The Premier keeps insisting that she'd already made up her mind to appoint her candidate. But Pat Sorbera told Andrew Olivier that the Premier was, in fact, weighing her options. Mr. Speaker, we are confronted with two versions of the truth, Pat Sorbera and Jerry Lougheed's version and the Premier's version. So my question is, it's apparent that somebody here is not being quite truthful. And through you, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Premier who is it? Question. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the, the conversation to which the leader of the third party refers is a conversation that took place after I had already had a conversation with the former candidate yeah. about the fact that I was going to appoint a candidate and that candidate was not going to be him, Mr. Speaker. So the attempts to keep him involved were just that. They were suggestions about things that he might apply for, that he might consider in order to stay involved, Mr. Speaker. Just as I expect that the leader of the third party had conversations with Jonah Shine and Paul Ferreira about keeping them involved, Mr. Speaker, when they failed to win their seats back, Mr. Speaker. I expect that she had similar conversations. That was the conversation that I had with Andrew Olivier, Mr. Speaker. That was the conversation that Pat Cerbera had, Mr. Speaker. And I expect... <laughs> New question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yeah, I'll okay. uh, My question is to the Premier. Premier, when we asked you yesterday about allegations you, and specifically your Deputy Chief of Staff, offered taxpayer-funded positions in return for political favour, you told us you were only working to keep the candidate involved in the party eight separate times. Premier, isn't this just code for getting Andrew to step aside, endorse Glenn, shut up and obey? Premier, can you tell Ontarians whether it was the full-time job in the constituency office, the part-time job in the constituency office, or the government appointments, supports, or commissions that you and your deputy were offering to keep Mr. Olivier involved Maybe with the Liberal of the Party? Peace. Justice of the Peace. Mr. Speaker, as I have
I said a number of times, the uh, the conversations that took place about uh, keeping the former candidate involved were conversations in the context of a decision having been made about an appointment. The fact is that the authority as the uh, leader of the Liberal Party that I have is an authority that comes from the party, Mr. Speaker. We have a constitution. The constitution allows me to Remember appoint a candidate. Carlton, so the fact order. is, I had made that decision that I was going to appoint a candidate. That candidate was going to be Glenn Tebow, Mr. Speaker. So there was no question of who the candidate was going to be. The only question was whether the past candidate wanted to stay involved in the party in any way. That's what the conversations were about, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Speaker, the Premier can BS us all she wants in this House. But yeah. when... Withdraw, please. Withdraw. Buck, um, I have now made this decision in my mind. I will not accept that term because what you cannot say indirectly, you will not say directly, and it impugns that. Please fill it. Finish. Sitting across from the OPP speaker, she better start telling the truth. Yeah. Premier, you said you'd be different. You said you were committed to accountability, committed to transparency. Today, you lead a government under the cloud of three separate OPP investigations, a record premier. Your deputy chief of staff is clearly heard on tape, clearly understood by people across Ontario to be offering a taxpayer-funded job to Mr. Olivier. Premier, you say the duties of the deputy chief of staff are separate from the ongoing investigation. But that's just the point, Premier. Your deputy crossed that line the moment she offered Mr. Olivier a government job. Premier, tell your never retreat, never explain, never Question. apologize deputy chief of staff to resign today. Here, here. Again, Mr. Speaker, let's just go over what happened. The fact is, I appointed, I made a decision to appoint a candidate in the Sudbury by election. Having made that decision, Mr. Speaker, there was an attempt to keep a young man who had run for the party involved. As I suspect, uh, I hope that someone over there is going to be talking to Paula Peroni and hoping that she might stay involved in the party. Or maybe you just cut her loose. What we want to do at, on this side, Mr. Speaker, is keep people involved. So, Glenn Tebow was going to be the candidate, Mr. Speaker. The attempts to reach out to the past. No question. A member from Timmins, James Bay. My uh, question, Speaker, is to the Premier. When did the Premier decide she was going to skip an open nomination process in Sudbury and appoint her candidate from a boardroom here in Toronto? Well, Mr. Speaker, I go back to my comments earlier about the fact that is that we have a constitution in the uh, Liberal Party that gives the authority to the leader to appoint a certain number of candidates, Mr. Speaker. That's part of the uh, the uh, decision of the party, and I have that authority, and I made that decision that in this case, because we uh, we had. We had the possibility of having Glenn Tebow as our candidate. I made the decision that I would make that appointment, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. But again, Speaker, to the Premier, that's not what the facts show. When Pat Sabera called Andre Olivier on December the 12th, she said to Andrew Olivier the following, force the Premier to move the appointment process is if that's the only option. That was the quote. She said, Seated, please. Uh, Two things. Number one, the dialogue that's going on between members of the two caucuses at the back will stop. I bring order to the House, sir. And uh, the second thing is, is uh, let's try to tie this into uh, government business, please. Again, when Pat Sabera called Andrew Olivier on December the 12th, she said to Andrew Olivier his actions would, quote, force the Premier to move the appointment process if that's the only option available. She said to Andrew, you've been asked by the Leader and by the Premier to make a decision to step aside to allow Glenn question. to have an opportunity uncontested. So the question is, there are two stories here. The Premier claims she Thank made you. up her mind previously, Thank but you. the facts in regard to the Thank you. The, uh, the Deputy House Leader will come to order. Here you go. Uh, excuse me, your time is up. Right, just Premier. Uh, Deputy Premier. 
Uh, uh, speaker, you know, I think um, it's time to kind of step back and think about the decision the Premier made to appoint a candidate, an extremely fine candidate who has served the community of Sudbury very, very well over the past six years as an MP. The Liberal Party of Ontario has a constitution that gives uh, the leader the right to appoint candidates. She exercised that right because Glenn Tebow, although he did represent a different party, and I know that's a sore point for the party opposite, he did represent a party, but he represented his community extremely well. We have brought that into our caucus, into our government, into this legislature. The focus of the party opposite on um, this personal destruction, and it's not Answer. just since the House came back. The whole campaign they ran was based on destruction of an Thank individual. You. Speaker, we're proud of our. Thank you. New question. Stop the clock. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The member from Kingston and the Isles. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy. In September, you launched Ontario's second poverty reduction strategy, realizing our potential. Building on the successes of our government's first strategy, Breaking the Cycle, released in 2008, the new strategy contains many measures to fight poverty, including expanding health benefits and nutrition programs for children in low-income families, creating a local poverty reduction fund to support organizations that achieve outcomes for people, and reducing child poverty by 25 per cent. Mr. Speaker, I'm also pleased to see the new strategy sets the bold, long-term goal of ending homelessness in Ontario, a goal that the minister shares with the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Question. Through you to the minister responsible for housing, uh, poverty reduction strategy. Can you please give this House an update on what our government is doing Thank to you. reach our goal of ending homelessness? Minister responsible for poverty reduction. Speaker, and thank you to the honourable member for uh, this very important question. Speaker, as the member mentioned, our new poverty reduction strategy sets a long-term goal of ending homelessness in Ontario. Speaker, it's the right thing to do, and it's the smart thing to do, because having a place to call home gives people a stable foundation from which they can build their lives back up again and rise out of poverty. Speaker, currently there is no consistent definition of homelessness. We have no consistent methods for counting the number of people who are homeless in Ontario, but we do know that we have a problem and we are determined to resolve that problem. Speaker, We need expert advice and that's why we've announced a new expert advisory po uh, panel on homelessness chaired jointly between the Minister of uh, uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing and myself. They're going to give us practical, actionable advice and expertise to help us define and Thank move you. forward on this very important commitment. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answer. In addition to her work on the file, I know that the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has been instrumental in the fight against homelessness in Ontario. Commitments in the new poverty reduction strategy, such as the $42 million increase to the Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative and the $16 million for 1,000 new supportive housing spaces for Ontarians living with mental health and addiction issues, demonstrate that we are already making strides when it comes to reducing homelessness. The expert advisory panel on homelessness is the next logical step in crafting an evidence-based approach to achieving our long-term goal of ending homelessness. Mr. Speaker, to the minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy, can you please Question. give my constituents in this House more information about the panel? Excellent. Thank you, Minister. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, minister, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to both the honourable member and the minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy. Uh, as the minister mentioned, the creation of the new expert advisory panel on homelessness means our government will, in fact, have the tools it needs to pursue an evidence-based approach to eliminating homelessness in Ontario. The panel consists of 13 members who reflect Ontario's geographic diversity, 
and have a wide range of experience and expertise, including people with lived experience of homelessness, from Hamilton, people East with Tony expertise in Aboriginal and youth homelessness, people with technical expertise in homelessness data and measurement, people with subject matter knowledge and expertise, and people with knowledge of the current Ontario practices in measuring homelessness Answer. The panel will also engage additional experts in groups such as youth, newcomers, seniors, Aboriginal people, Thank you. the LGBTQ Thank you. community. No question. The member from Renfrew Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Premier, yesterday was another sad chapter in the ongoing saga of the gas plant scandal and the Liberal Party's coordinated efforts to delete emails and wipe hard drives with the tabling of your whitewashed, sanitized report by your committee. Late last year, under the cover of, dark, of Christmas break and darkness, it was announced that the Liberal Party would repay the $10,000 that the government had paid Peter Feist to destroy hard drives and delete emails in your office. Premier, Peter Feist is the boyfriend of the former Deputy Chief of Staff, who is now under a cloud of darkness for giving false testimony to the committee. This is further evidence that taxpayers' money was used inappropriate, inappropriately by your Liberal government and another Question. example of your lack of leadership. Will you commit to restrike the gas plant committee so that we can finish the job of getting to the bottom of your scandal? Thank you. You say that, please. You say that, please. Thank you, Premier. House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Speaker, uh, we are we are glad that the uh, the Justice Committee has completed its work. I want to thank all the members of the Justice Committee who have, have done tremendous work over the last uh, three years uh, in making sure that uh, that we get uh, good information as to uh, as to how uh, decisions were made around around uh, the the gas plants. Uh, Speaker, as as you are aware, that a gas plant committee uh, listened to about 93 witnesses. Uh, uh, some of them uh, multiple uh, times. Uh, they received uh, uh, almost half a million pages of, of, of documents, including about 30,000 pages of documents from the Premier's office. And as a result of all that uh, work and deliberation, Speaker, uh, they, uh, they have provided a, a critical assessment of government record-keeping practices yes, and the way in which large energy projects are cited. And we look forward to uh, evaluating and implementing those recommendations provided. Premier, I could say that was a shiftless response, but I'll say it was a responseless shift. You know, it, it brings up three words. Three words, it can be summed up in three words. Failure of leadership. Let's be honest with what this check from the Liberal Party was all about. That your party paid Peter Feist, the boyfriend of Laura Miller, former Deputy Chief of Staff, to eliminate evidence in a criminal investigation and destroy property belonging to the people of Ontario wow. and to prevent this House and the OPP from getting to the bottom of your gas plant scandal. The report submitted yesterday changes nothing. This is not over. Through the power of your majority, you forced the committee to produce an incomplete report. Mm -hmm. Will you commit to restriking the committee and sure. allow us to investigate and question Laura Miller, Peter Feist, and David Livingston, the key Thank players you. in this scandalous cover-up. Start the clock. Start the clock. The, uh, the member from Stormont will come to order. The member from uh, Renfrew, I have to say it, will withdraw. Withdraw. <laughs> Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, Speaker, we should we should let OPP do its job. Our job is to make sure that we we look at the 16 substantive recommendations that has been provided by the Justice Committee and make sure that we implement those recommendations. Speaker, I'm I'm very I'm I'm glad to see that there are some really important recommendations that are provided in this report uh, around uh, regarding the cost of the relocations uh, re uh, in making sure that we have uh, extensive and substantive 
of uh, engagement with communities where large infrastructure projects are planned uh, to be cited, and better record manage, uh, management uh, keeping practices. And Speaker, we have been working over the last couple of years under the leadership of, of this Premier in, in making sure that we're making all the necessary changes in terms of better staff training for mandatory record keeping uh, training, uh, passing an accountability act which has different penalties Answer. around deletion of records. I'm actually very sad to see, Speaker, that the opposition parties provided no substantive recommendation after Thank incredible you. amount of work that was done in this matter. New, new question, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, can you confirm whether you directed Pat Sorbera to offer Andrew Olivier a full-time or a part-time job at a constituency office or appointments to boards or commissions? And are those job offers still on the table for Mr. Olivier? Thank you, Speaker. Um, the Premier has, uh, on several occasions, uh, discussed uh, this particular issue. So let's just take a moment. And uh, and I, I did this yesterday, and I'm going to do it again today because I have a feeling not everybody was really paying attention to understand what a fine new colleague we have in this legislature, Speaker. So and and we offer our congratulations. And it is the tradition of this House that a new MPP, regardless of whether they're on your side or someone else's side, a new MPP is given the courtesy of respect respect and, um, and the congratulations. So yeah. who is Glenn Tebow? Who is this all about, Speaker? Well, throughout his career, he's shown an unwavering commitment to a better, fairer Sudbury. And I have a feeling that the That's member from Nickelbelt knows better than most of us the contribution that our new member has made to Sudbury. Thank you. He's fought tireless. Yes. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the, back to the Premier. Premier, when Jerry Lougheed spoke to Andrew Olivier, he began the conversation by saying, I come to you on behalf of the Premier. Premier, can you confirm that you authorized Jerry Lougheed to make offers to Andrew Olivier on your behalf? Deputy Premier. So, uh, Speaker, what we're witnessing is the same negativity that voters have rejected. Voters have rejected the kind of ne negativity that we are seeing expressed in this House today. Uh, the by-election uh, the campaign that was run by the NDP, and apparently the, the PC is to the extent that they ran a campaign, um, but the, um, the negativity was rejected. The people of Sudbury made a decision. They made a very good decision. They made a decision where all of the information was uh, presented to them. The public has said they demand more. They, they uh, reject the negativity of the opposition, and they elected someone who will make a positive contribution to the lives of people in Sudbury. Glenn Tebow, the, me the member from Sudbury, has a very strong and positive record driving okay, change, and uh, we welcome him and look forward to the contribution he will make here in the legislature. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time and poses a threat to our infrastructure, food supply, drinking water, and our economic competitiveness. But climate change is a problem with a solution. While the opposition has refused to put forward meaningful solutions here, here. to this challenge, our government's taken action, closing Ontario's coal plants, curbing the use of cosmetic pesticides, and protecting 1.8 million acres of land with the green belt. These initiatives have resulted in fewer smog days and cleaner water for all Ontarians. I was pleased to see last week that the minister has launched a climate change discussion paper and invited Ontarians, businesses and communities to share their thoughts on how we can best combat Question. climate change while continuing to grow our economy. Speaker, through you to the minister, to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change inform this House about the nature of his discussion Thank paper you. and the consultations with Ontario. Minister of the Environment and Climate Thank Change. You, uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's, 
you know, it's particularly helpful to have people like the member from Cambridge, who is a nurse who understands the health implications for families, Lyme disease, yeah. uh, and I, it's great to have such a champion in the House, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Premier and I, the Minister of Natural Resources, the Minister of Infrastructure, the Minister of Economic Development, the Minister of Health, our entire cabinet, Mr. Speaker, our entire caucus understands that the biggest, most important issue we're facing for our families and our children is climate change, Mr. Speaker. We are fast tracking to a four degree mean temperature change on this planet in the latter half of this century, Mr. Speaker. That, that is the biggest challenge we as human beings have faced uh, in our entire history. We're also seized with the economic opportunity. Mr. Speaker, as John Kerry, the U.S. Secretary of State, said, we will be we will be seeing a six trillion dollar expansion of the Western economy. Answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and that opportunity is also unprecedented. We want Ontario to lead in this new economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I'm really pleased to see our government is continuing to build on the progress that we've already made in reducing greenhouse gases and fighting climate change while helping our businesses to increase their productivity and competitiveness to build on our strong economic growth. I note that the climate change discussion sets out a bold vision which would establish Ontario as a leader in climate change mitigation and science, redesign and build strong carbon-neutral economy, communities, infrastructure and energy, protect ecosystems including air, land, water, and leave a legacy of a healthy world for our children, my children, and future generations. I know my constituents in Cambridge have many great ideas for Ontario's upcoming climate change strategy and how they can reduce their carbon footprint while helping to make Question. Ontario's economy stronger and more competitive. Speaker, could the minister inform the House how Ontarians across the province can join the conversation on climate change? Thank you, Minister. I, I certainly, uh, certainly can, and I'm very happy to, uh, um, Madam Speaker. I just, uh, Mr. Speaker, we are going to every corner of the province, uh, Mr. S uh, Thunder Bay, Ottawa, large southwestern Ontario. Uh, we will be uh, in engaged in direct conversations with Ontarios, with regular folks, municipal leaders, labour leaders, business leaders, environmentalists, families, moms, dad, grandma. This is everybody's conversation, Mr. Speaker, and it has to land well. This is the second time we've done this, Mr. Speaker. Our Climate Ready Strategy started this same way five years ago, and I'm very happy to report to the House that our 6 per cent reduction below 1990 levels has been achieved for 2014, mm. Mr. Speaker, and we know we're going to meet our 2020. Wow. But, Mr. Speaker, all members can participate, all Ontarians can participate by going to www.ontario.ca climate change, where all the paper, all the data is, and we're going to be reading those and really building on the knowledge and expertise and thoughtfulness of Ontarians to get this Thank right you. economically and environmentally. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Chief Electoral Officer Greg Asenza has repeated his call for limiting advertising by special interest groups during election periods. We support his recommendation. Mr. Asenza is an officer of this legislature, and I respectfully suggest all members of this House should be mindful of his advice. Premier, will you accept and implement the advice of the Chief Electoral Officer? Thank you. Premier. Attorney General. The Attorney General. We, uh, we are always open uh, to uh, conversation on ways to improve Ontario's democratic process. Absolutely. Ontario has rules in place to ensure that there is both transparency and free speech in our election campaigns. Third-party advertising rules were introduced in Ontario National for the first time coalition. in its 2007 reforms to election Major legislation. Incident. So, under current rule, third party that spend $500 uh, or more on election advertising are required to register with the chief electoral officer. So, registered third parties must also report to the chief electoral officer on election advertising expenses. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll say this. When they were in power, they did nothing. In 2007, the Ontario, for the first time, in its reform, uh, put uh, those rules in place. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. 
In the last election, special interest groups spent $9 million in political advertising. That's more than 19 registered political parties combined and three times more than spent in 2007. Under your watch, Premier, the deep pockets of the well-connected special interest groups win while democracy and the citizens of Ontario lose. This is a direct violation of the principle of equality, one person, one vote, that is fundamental to democratic government. Free speech should be free. Premier, you can't justify buying free speech or allowing it to be bought. You know it's time to bring Ontario in line with the rest of the country on electoral reform. Premier, will you cap third-party advertising spending, yes or no? Yeah. 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 Again, Mr. Speaker, we always uh, welcome the good yeah. recommendation from the Chief Electoral yeah. Officer. And uh, for the first time, as I said, in 2007, Ontario, for the first time in its 2007 reform to its election, introduced the rule, third party advertising rules. So this was done in 2007. We're always uh, looking for good advice from the Chief Electoral Officer. And uh, I, I'll say that uh, this party was uh, very, uh, very uh, quick to uh, do uh, to put some some rule around the advertise election advertising. Do that. So uh, we uh, we are always welcome is good advice, no and we will take that into uh, uh, to, to consideration. Thank you. Thank you. New no question, member from Nickel Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la Première Ministre. The Premier says Thank you. Question for the Prime Minister, the Premier. Before offers were made to Andrew Olivier. That's not what Pat Sorbera and Jerry Longhead are saying. They are saying that offers were on the tables and no decision. Stop the clock. Order, please. Please continue. So, they said that offers were on the table, that no decisions had been made. This is what the Premier is claiming. Yesterday, the Premier said, I had in my role as the leaders of the Liberal Party of Ontario made the decision to appoint a candidate in Sudbury. I had already made the decision to appoint. My question is simple, is when did you make your decision to appoint? Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. And when the member from uh, Nickel Belt got up to ask a question, I was sure she was going to ask a question about health care, Speaker. I was sure that there were issues in this province affecting people in her community and beyond, and she wanted to have the opportunity to put that question uh, to the minister. I was sad to see she is continuing the, the theme of negativity, personal attack that we've seen from, uh, from both parties. So, I want to congratulate the member from Sudbury. I want to congratulate the people of Sudbury for choosing such a fine representative. You know, the, um, this, is, this is a citizen of Sudbury who has time and time again demonstrated his Answer. worthiness. The people of Sudbury made a thoughtful, informed, and wise choice. And we look forward to working with the, with the member from Sudbury Thank you. Uh, as he works to improve the life. Supplementary. Back to the Premier Speaker. Here are some of the facts. Jerry Lawhey said to Andrew Olivier on the tape that everybody can listen to, the Premier up to now has always said to me she's in favour of a nomination race. So I want to make it clear she's never said to me I want to appoint Glenn Thibault. Pat Sorbera says exactly the same thing. To Olivier, she says, you've been asked directly by the leader and the premier to make a decision to step aside. You recognize then the decision position you're going to find yourself in, right? When she, the premier, is going to have to make a decision around the appointment versus letting things go ahead. The question is simple, Speaker. When did you make the decisions to appoint? Well, you know, Speaker, uh, as somebody said earlier, pot, meat, kettle. Um, the NDP's decision to install Adam Giambroni. You might remember Adam Giambroni in 2000. 
13, um, is well known. The Toronto Star reported uh, Giambroni, who was parachuted into the run, you might remember this, uh, allegedly stacked the nomination meeting speaker. And it's obvious that the third party has hired past candidates, past MPPs, that's been mentioned before. So let's go back to the quality of the candidate that was elected by the people of Sudbury, Speaker. Um, Glenn Tebow has fought tirelessly for supports for people with developmental d disabilities, for quality service for families struggling with autism. Speaker, as director of the United Way, how more grassroots can you get than that, Speaker? He led many successful campaigns Answer. in support of community development. He's a proud volunteer with Big Brothers Big Sisters, something I share with him, and he's coached minor hockey and football, Thank you. which I have not done, Speaker. He's a Thank you. New question. The member from Davenport. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, we all remember the ice storm of December 2013 so well. It caused widespread damage and blockouts, blackouts across southern, western, and eastern Ontario, and at its peak left over 800,000 hydro customers without power. Many of the members in this House, including yourself, Minister, know this firsthand from the, uh, know this firsthand from the storm's impact on our own communities. In my own riding of Davenport, many residents were left without heat and power for several days, and a warming Center was open at JJ Piccinini Community Center on St. Clair Avenue. In response, our government announced that it would offer a one-time ice storm assistance program. Your staff has now received all 58 applications from the municipalities and conservation authorities seeking Question. reimbursement through the program. Last Friday, your ministry shared an important and long-awaited update. Minister, please tell this House how our Thank government you. is moving forward in support of these. Thank you, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the honourable member uh, for that uh, question. And Good question. Yes, of course I remember. Uh, I remember something else. I remember the incredible efforts of all the municipal and EMS staff who are out there uh, building a stronger community by reaching out to their yeah. community. And uh, I want to start by complimenting uh, them. Absolutely. Speaker, the province has initiated final payments to uh, Three municipalities, uh, townships of Mapleton, Center Wellington, and Pusslinch. And here's some more good news. The other 52 uh, municipalities and six conservation authorities that have submitted claims have been offered an interim payment, and most have uh, availed themselves of that opportunity, uh, which is uh, really good. So they can get on with the uh, task of continuing to build that strong, caring. Answer community that on a good day we all in this house want to see happen. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, it's wonderful to hear that municipalities that have been waiting for assistance with their public costs will be able to benefit from support. I know I speak for the municipal, municipal leaders in Toronto when I say they have been eagerly awaiting these funds. Reimbursement will go towards costs incurred to protect public health and safety and to secure access to public roads, sidewalks, and frequently traveled routes. These interim funds will also assist municipalities with their budget plans. Planning. Mr. Speaker, these interim funds will be welcome, but can the minister tell us why the ministry isn't flowing the full amount municipalities have Question. requested yet? Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we uh, initiated these interim payments now because we didn't want municipalities to wait any longer for at least a partial reimbursement of those expenses that they have. Um, by the way, the interim payment uh, has been very, very well received by municipalities. Um, it's important that we begin flowing these interim funds uh, so that they can get on with the remainder of their claims. Uh, we can uh, adjudicate those as quickly as we can without uh, uh, disadvantaging them uh, uh, in any real way. So we're going to flow funds in a responsible way, ensuring that public dollars are spent wisely. And as I explained earlier, the feds are involved in this too, so we've got two sets of accountability mechanisms here. Each claim is going to be reviewed uh, carefully, and uh, as soon as we get that uh, adjudicated, the full payment will be delivered uh, to municipalities, uh, Thank you. Mr. Speaker, as, as they're hoping for. Right. New member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. 
Answer my question to Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, I'm very uh, concerned about the state of Ontario's health care system and the availability of doctors in my riding. Under your imposed contract with the doctors in Ontario, you're prohibiting new Deputy doctors from joining family health Last teams time. in well-serviced areas. Yeah, right. However, your government's model in defining well-serviced areas is extremely flawed. My ride has experienced a shortage of doctors for a number of years. The city of St. Thomas, Elmer, Rodney have lost up to six doctors, and in fact, the municipality of Dun Dun Dutton Dunwich has only had one doctor for a number of years. Minister, too many people in my riding are without doctors. In fact, a number of the doctors in my riding will be retiring in the next three to five years, and your current model of family health teams will not allow for succession planning. Minister, can you share with me your plans to address the doctor shortage that you have created? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Health, long term care. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the uh, question. Opposite. Actually, I have good news because what we're doing with the changes uh, that resulted from the OMA's refusal to uh, uh, walk away from the table after a year of negotiations and not accept the fair offer that was presented to them and the fair offer that was recommended by, frankly, the umpire that we brought in, retired Judge Warren Winkler, who was our conciliator, uh, aiming to actually bring the two parties together. He said that the government's offer was a fair offer and actually implored the OMA to accept, uh, accept our offer as well, feeling that it was fair. But what we've done with our family health teams for our important family doctors that are graduating is precisely what you're asking for, is we're directing those resources to those parts of the province that need them both. So yes. to the underserved areas, the areas where there are doctor shortages, where we need to make that That's added effort to make sure that our family doctors, that frankly broad family health team, uh, the professionals that, that provide that important care, go to those areas of the province that need it most. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Minister, what's, what's not fair about the system is the fact that your system classifies my area as well-serviced, which it's not. It's flawed. And under this new uh, decision you've made with the Ontario doctors, doctors cannot come to my riding. Minister, it's clear that you have no plan for the health care systems. You're ignoring the groups like Ontario Medical Association who want to work with you, who have plans to make this system better. Not only has your government stopped new doctors from joining family health teams, you have now threatened doctors to penalize them who see too many patients. Minister, the baby boom generation is growing. It's a tremendous increase on the usage of our health care system, yet your government cuts services and access to health care in order to balance the budget. Minister, why are you cutting health care to make your government's financial budget commitment? Question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't quite know where to start. We aren't cutting health care. The health care budget continues to increase year over year as it does as it does as it as it has for many, many years. The physician services budget, which is currently at eleven billion dollars, ten percent of every dollar that this government spends in the province, that fund for physicians specifically is going up by one point two five percent next year, one point two five percent the year after that, one point two five percent the year following. We are increasing health care. We're, incre we're committed to our family health teams. More than three million Ontarians currently have access to a, a family health team. But I, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, I'm disappointed at the response at the question because we worked hard and diligently in, with good faith intentions with the OMA for over a year, a year and a day to be exact. The uh, retired Judge Warren Winkler came forward as an independent umpire. He took our side, Mr. Speaker. He asked the OMA to accept Thank the fair you. offer. Yeah. The member from Huron, Bruce, on a point of order. Thank you very much. Speaker, I'd like to draw to the, the House's attention that this morning the Minister of Environment announced the Great Lakes Protection Act outside of the House at Ripley's Believe It or Not Aquarium. And is it not the privilege of the House to hear of acts being called forward in the House before anyone else hears it? Thank you. member for her point of order and uh, I would all remind all members I have no authority over when and where those announcements are going to make however I would also say to the government and to the specific minister that the traditions of the place is always to make those announcements here in the house further uh, member from Chatham Kent Essex on a point of order 
Thank you very much, Speaker. It's my, my, my privilege this morning to, uh, to introduce uh, to the gallery, uh, to, or rather to our legislators, uh, in the, earlier in the public gallery, Allison Story, a member of, uh, from Chatham, Ken Essex, who is uh, here visiting the uh, uh, Queen's Park today. Thank you. Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd actually like to correct my earlier record of introduction. I'm pleased to um, introduce Catherine Bose, who I had said was the mother of former Paige, Amber Bowes. Amber is our new Paige. Her sister, Ashley Bowes, was our former Paige. So pleased to see her back and to congratulate Amber on her first day in The record has been corrected. The member from Cambridge on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. It's my privilege to welcome today in the gallery Christine Ryer, president of ACO Cambridge, who is there with a lot of my friends from ACO. And I had seen Jean Hallboom, a former Waterloo Regional Councillor, that has left the gallery, but I know she was here. So welcome to Queen's Park. There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon, and that usually means now is the time where everybody stands still.